thoughts turning green Your eyes no longer see Life's reality All right. There we go. An interesting start to Savannah Lexicon. We had a couple by. We had a ghost to start with, a ghost in the machine. And then we had a couple from Black Sabbath. Started off with uh, Electric Funeral and went into Hand of Doom, both off the Paranoid album. And appropriate for Halloween, don't you think? It is indeed Halloween. Okay, I'm going to do something very different, very experimental here for Savannah Lexicon and for me. And we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, it could be interesting. Maybe you'll like it. Maybe you'll like it. We'll see. I am going to actually read an edited excerpt from... Um, Washington Irving's 1820 classic, <clears throat> The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. All right. So settle into your car seat if you're in the car. Settle into your chair if you're in a chair. Just sit back and relax and let's do a little Halloween, shall we? In the bosom of one of those spacious coves which indent the eastern shore of the South Georgia coastline at that broad expansion of the river denominated by the ancient British navigators, the Savannah River, and where they always prudently shortened sail and implored the protection of St. Nicholas when they crossed, there lies a small market town or rural port which is known by the name of Savannah. The dominant spirit that haunts this enchanted region and seems to be commander-in-chief of all the powers of the air is the apparition of a figure on horseback without a head. It is said by some to be the ghost of a Yankee trooper whose head had been carried away by a cannonball in some nameless battle during the Revolutionary War. And who is ever and anon seen by the country folk, hurrying along in the gloom of night as if on the wings of the wind. His haunts are not confined to the valley, but extend at times to the adjacent roads, and especially to the vicinity of the church that is at no great distance. Indeed, certain of the most authentic historians of those parts who have been careful in collecting and collating the floating facts concerning this specter allege that the body 
of the trooper. Having been buried in the churchyard, the ghost rides forth to the scene of battle in nightly quest of his head. and that the rushing speed with which he sometimes passes along the hollow like a midnight blast is owing to his being belated and in a hurry to get back to the churchyard before daybreak. The specter is known at all the country firesides by the name of the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow. There was a teacher in these parts named Ichabod Crane. He was tall but exceedingly lank with narrow shoulders, long arms and legs, hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves, feet that might have served for shovels, and his whole frame was most loosely hung together. His head was small and flat at top with huge ears, large green glassy eyes, and a long snipe nose, so that it looked like a weathercock perched upon his spindle neck to tell which way the wind blew. To see him striding along the profile of a hill on a windy day, with his clothes bagging and fluttering about him, one might have mistaken him for the genius of famine descending upon the earth, or some scarecrow eloped from a cornfield. Ichabod was particularly taken by author Cotton Mather's History of New England Witchcraft, in which, by the way, he most firmly and potently believed. Ichabod went to a social gathering one night, and the conversation turned to many tales of the region, including, of course, the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow. It was the very witching time of night that Ichabod pursued his travel homeward through the forested terrain outside Savannah. In which he had traveled so cheerily in the afternoon. The hour was as dismal as himself in the dead hush of midnight. He could even hear the barking of the watchdog from the river. But it was so vague and faint as only to give an idea of his distance from the fateful companion of man. Now and then, too, the long-drawn crowing of a cock accidentally awakened would sound far, far off from some farmhouse away among the hills. But it was like a dreaming sound in his ear. No signs of life occurred near him, but occasionally the melancholy chirp of a cricket or perhaps the guttural twang of a bullfrog from a neighboring marsh, as if sleeping uncomfortably and turning suddenly in his bed. All the stories of ghosts and goblins that he had heard in the afternoon now came crowding upon his recollection. The night grew darker and darker. The stars seemed to sink deeper in the sky and driving clouds occasionally hid them from his sight. He had never felt so lonely and dismal. He was, moreover, approaching the very place where many of the scenes of the ghost stories had been laid. In the center of the road stood an enormous live oak tree, which towered like a giant above all the other trees of the neighborhood and formed a kind of landmark. Its limbs were gnarled and fantastic large enough to form trunks. What was that?
large enough to form trunks for ordinary trees. Twisting down almost to the earth and rising again into the air, it was connected with the tragic story of the unfortunate Andre, who had been taken prisoner hard by and was universally known by the name of Major Andre's Tree. The common people regarded it with a mixture of respect and superstition, partly out of sympathy for the fate of its ill-starred namesake, and partly from the tales of strange sights and doleful lamentations told concerning it. As Ichabod approached this fearful tree, he began to whistle. He thought his whistle was answered, but it was a blast sweeping sharply from the dry branches. As he approached a little nearer, he thought he saw something white hanging in the midst of the tree. He paused and ceased whistling, but on looking more narrowly, perceived that it was a place where the tree had been scathed by lightning and the white wood laid bare. Suddenly he heard a groan. His teeth chattered and his knees smote against the saddle. It was but the rubbing of one huge bough upon another. As they were spayed and swayed about by the breeze, he passed the tree in safety but new perils lay before him. About 200 yards from the tree, a small brook crossed the road and ran into a marsh and thicky, thickly wooded glen known by the name of Wiley's Swamp. A few rough logs laid side by side served for a bridge over this stream. On that side of the road where the brook entered the wood, a group of oaks and chestnuts matted thick with wild grapevines. Threw a cavernous gloom over it. To pass this bridge was the severest trial. It was at this identical spot that the unfortunate Andre was captured. And under the covert of those chestnuts and vines were the sturdy yeoman concealed who surprised him. This has ever since been considered a haunted stream. As he approached the stream, his sound, his heart, began to thump. summoned up, however, all his resolution, gave his horse half a score of kicks, in the ribs and attempted to dash briskly across the bridge, but instead of starting forward, the perverse old animal made a lateral movement and ran broadside against the fence. Ichabod, whose fears increased with the delay, jerked the reins on the other side. and kicked lustily with the contrary foot. It was all in vain. His steed startled, it is true, but it was only a plunge to the opposite side of the road into a thicket of brambles and alder bushes. The schoolmaster now bestowed both whip and heel upon the starveling ribs of his old horse gunpowder, who dashed forward, snuffling and snorting, but came to a stand just by the bridge with a suddenness that had nearly sent his rider sprawling over his head. Just at that moment, a small, splashy sound by the side of the bridge caught the sensitive ear of Ichabod, and in the, in the dark shadow of the grove, on the margin of the brook, he beheld something huge, misshapen, black, and towering. It stirred not, but seemed gathered up in the gloom, like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveler. 
The hair of the affrighted teacher rose upon his head with terror. What was to be done? To turn and fly was now too late, and besides, what chance was there of escaping ghost or goblin, if such it was, which could ride upon the wings of the wind? Summoning up, therefore, a show of courage, he demanded in stammering accents, Who, who, who are you? He received no reply. He repeated his demand in a still more agitated voice, Who, who are you? Still... There was no answer. Once more he cudgeled the sides of the inflexible gunpowder and shutting his eyes broke forth with involuntary fervor into a psalm tune. Just then the shadowy object of alarm put itself in motion and with a scramble and a bound stood at once in the middle of the road. Though the night was dark and dismal, yet the form of the unknown might now in some degree be ascertained. He appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions and mounted on a black horse of powerful frame. He made no offer of molestation or sociability, but kept aloof on one side of the road, jogging along on the blind side of old Gunpowder, who had now got over his fright and waywardness. Ichabod, who had no relish for this strange midnight companion, and bethought himself of the adventure of Brom Bones with the galloping Hessian, now quickened his steed in hopes of leaving him behind. The stranger, however, quickened his horse to an equal pace. Ichabod pulled up and fell into a walk, thinking to lag behind. The other did the same. His heart began to sink within him. He endeavored to resume his psalm tune, but his parched tongue clove to the roof of his mouth, and he could not utter a stave. There was something in the moody and dogged silence of this pertinacious companion that was mysterious and appalling. It was soon fearfully accounted for. On mounting a rising ground, which brought the figure of his fellow traveler in relief against the sky, Gigantic in height and muffled in a cloak, Ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving that he was headless. But his horror was still more increased on observing that the head, which should have rested on his shoulders, was carried before him on the pommel of his saddle. His terror rose to desperation. He rained a shower of kicks and blows upon gunpowder, hoping by a sudden movement to give his companion the slip, but the specter started full jump with him. Away they rode. They dashed through thick and thin, stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound. Ichabod's flimsy garments fluttered in the air as he stretched his long, lank body away over his horse's head. In the eagerness of his flight, they had now reached the road which turns off to Sleepy Hollow. But Gunpowder, who seemed possessed with a demon instead of keeping up, made an opposite turn and plunged Headlong downhill to the left, this road leads through a sandy hollow shaded by trees for about a quarter of a mile, where it crosses the bridge famous in Goblin Story. And just beyond swells the green knoll on which stands the white watched church. And yet as the panic of the steed had given his unskillful ride, his unskillful rider an apparent advantage in the chase, but just as he had got halfway through the hollow, the girths of the saddle gave way, and he felt it slipping from under him. He seized it by the pommel and endeavored to hold it firm, but in vain, and had just time to save himself by clasping old gunpowder around the neck when the saddle fell to the earth and he heard it trampled underfoot by his pursuer. For a moment, the terror... of Hans Van Ripper's wrath passed through his mind. For it was his Sunday saddle, 
But this was no time for petty fears. The goblin was hard on his haunches, and he had much ado to maintain his seat, sometimes slipping on one side, sometimes on another, and sometimes jostled on the high ridge of the horse's backbone with a violence that he verily feared would cleave him asunder. An opening in the trees now cheered him with the hopes that the church bridge was at hand. The wavering reflection of a silver star in the bosom of the brook told him that he was not mistaken. He saw the walls of the church dimly glaring under the trees beyond. He recollected the place where Broom Bones' ghostly competitor had disappeared. If I can but reach that bridge, thought Ichabod, I am safe. Just then he heard the black steed panting and blowing close behind him. He even fancied that he felt his hot breath. Another convulsive kick in the ribs, an old gunpowder sprung upon the bridge. He thundered over the resounding planks. He gained the opposite side, and now Ichabod cast a look behind to see if his pursuer should vanish, according to rule, in a flash of fire and brimstone. Just then he saw the goblin rising in his stirrups and in the very act of hurling his head at him. Ichabod endeavored to dodge the horrible missile, but too late it encountered his cranium. With a tremendous crash, he was tumbled headlong into the dust, and Gunpowder, the black steed, and the goblin rider passed by like a whirlwind. The next morning, the old horse was found without his saddle, and with the bridle under his feet, soberly cropping the grass at his master's gate. Ichabod did not make his appearance at breakfast, Dinner hour came, but no Ichabod. The boys assembled at the schoolhouse and strolled idly about the banks of the brook, but no schoolmaster. Hans Van Ripper now began to feel some uneasiness about the fate of poor Ichabod and his saddle. An inquiry was set on foot, and after diligent investigation, they came upon his traces. In one part of the road leading to the church was found the saddle trampled in the dirt. The tracks of horses' hooves deeply dented in the road and evidently at furious speed were tracked to the bridge. Beyond which on the bank of a broad side of the brook where the water ran deep and black was found the hat of the unfortunate Ichabod and close beside it a shattered pumpkin. The brook was searched, but the body of the schoolmaster was not to be discovered. The mysterious event caused much speculation at the church on the following Sunday. Knots of gazers and gossips were collected in the churchyard at the bridge and at the spot where the hat and pumpkin had been found. The stories of Brower of Bones and a whole budget of others were called to mind. And when they had diligently considered them all and compared them with the symptoms of the present case, they shook their heads and came to the conclusion that Ichabod had been carried off by the galloping Hessian. The old country wives, however, who are the best judges of these matters, maintain to this day that Ichabod was spirited away by supernatural means, and it was a favorite story often told about the neighborhood around the winter f evening fire. The bridge became more than ever an object of superstitious awe, and that may be the reason why the road has been altered of late years so as to approach the church by the border of the mill pond. The schoolhouse being deserted soon fell to decay and was reported to be haunted by the ghost of the unfortunate teacher and the plowboy loitering homeward of a still summer evening, has often fancied his voice at a distance, chanting a melancholy psalm tune among the tranquil solitudes of Sleepy Hollow. Join WRUU radio listeners, hosts, volunteers, and supporters at our annual meeting and party this upcoming Sunday afternoon. This yearly event is a celebration of all the time, treasure, and talent 
given by the Savannah community in support of this radio station. We've grown so much this past year because of the hard work and dedication of so many people. This party will give us a chance to highlight such achievements and thank all those who make 107.5 FM Savannah's best radio station. This free event will include music, an open house, and Southern-inspired food and drinks. That's Sunday, November 5th from 4 to 8 p.m. at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Savannah Fellowship Hall. The entrance is on the 300 block of East Macon Street. For more information, find our event page on Facebook or visit WRUU.org. And this is Wayne back with you. You are, of course, listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. Listen, if your business enjoys our programming on WRUULP, please support the station with a donation. Let your customers, neighbors, and friends know that you share our vision of building a thriving community based on diverse, vibrant radio programming. As a business partner, our listeners will know you support Savannah's only broad-based community radio station. Become a tower sponsor or underwriter. To check out the levels of corporate sponsorship and to donate, go to www.wruu.org business. Again, to check out the levels of corporate sponsorship and to donate, go to www.wruu.org business. Thank you for listening to and supporting WRUULP. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed the Savannah Lexicon rendition of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. I have one more for you. I think we'll have time to squeeze it in here. It is, after all, Halloween. And this is the very special edition. Halloween edition of Savannah Lexicon. I mean, if that's not special, I don't know what is. All right, this this particular tale is Mr. Edgar Allan Poe, 1842. The Mask of the Red Death. There once was a pestilence upon the land, a horrible disease that came to be called the Red Death. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness and then profuse bleeding at the pores with eventual demise. After the populace had been ravaged by the Red Death for a time, the prince of the land, Prince Prospero, summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court. and with these retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the boats. They resolved to leave means neither for uh, egress or ingress to the sudden impulses of despair or frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned, not only with food and drink, but also with various entertainments. There were buffoons. There were improvisatory. There were ballet dancers. There were musicians. There was beauty. There was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. It was towards the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, the Prince Prostero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificent. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade. The prince had seven rooms painted a different color and adorned each with bizarre, light-colored oddments. 
There was also a gigantic ebony clock against the wall of the main room. It was a gay and magnificent revel, the orchestra playing, dancers waltzing, wine flowing, chatter and laughter fluctuating and punctuating the air. The revel went whirlingly on, until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock, and then the music ceased. As I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted. The whole company, indeed, seemed now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of a stranger neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt, and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. <clears throat> The mask, which concealed the visage, was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat, and yet all this might have been endured if not approved by the mad revelers around, but the masquerader had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the face, was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. When the eyes of the Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, which, with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers. He was seen to be considered, he was seen to be convulsed in that first moment with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste, but in the next his brow reddened with rage. Who dares, he demanded hoarsely, of the courtiers who stood near him. Who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the Prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where stood the prince with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand and now with deliberate and stately step made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the strange masquerader had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth hand to seize him, so that, unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's person, and while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through, the, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet 
upon which instantly afterward fell prostate in death the Prince Prospero. Then summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment and seizing the masquerader whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in an utterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness untenanted by any tangible form. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel and died each in the despairing posture of his or her fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the light-hearted. And the flames of the tripods expired and darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. All right, happy Halloween, everyone. Happy Halloween. All right, I'm going to take one short breather and be back for the close of the show. I won't be going long. Hold on. Won't you spare me over till another year? Well, what is this that I can't see with ice cold hands taking hold of me? Well, I am death, none can excel. I'll open the door to heaven or hell. Oh, death, someone would pray. Could you wait to call me another day? The children prayed, the preacher preached, time and mercy is out of your reach. I'll fix your feet till you can't walk, I'll lock your jaw till you can't talk. I'll close your eyes so you can't see this very hour, come and go with me. Death, I come to take the soul, leave the body and leave it cold. To drop the flesh off of the frame, the earth and worm both have a claim. Oh, death, oh, death. Won't you spare me over till another year? My mother came to my bed, placed a cold towel upon my head. My head is warm, my feet are cold, death is a-moving upon my soul. Oh, death, how you treating me? You're closed my eyes so I can't see. Well, you're hurting my body. You make me cold. You run my life right out of my soul. Oh, death, please consider my age. Please don't take me at this stage. My wealth is all at your command, if you will move your icy hands. Oh, the young, the rich or poor, all alike me, you know. 
No wealth, no land, no silver, no gold. Nothing satisfies me but your soul. Oh, dead. Oh, dead. Won't you spare me over till another year? Won't you spare me over till another year? Won't you spare me over till another year? All right. That was the unmistakable voice of Ralph Stanley. That was off of the Old Brother Where Art Thou soundtrack CD. I've only got just a few minutes now for the last version of Savannah Lexicon, which I'll try and do in normal fashion rather than necessarily Halloween fashion. However, I will mention real quick that there are <clears throat> still some Halloween things going on. Of course, uh, there is the Alley Terra Plantation on Eisenhower Drive that's going to be going tonight and also November 3rd and 4th. Uh, there's Lot 13 Haunted House which is at 611 West Jones Street. That's going to be going on tonight as well as also November 3rd and 4th. So there's that. I want you to know that next week, my guests on Savannah Lexicon include on Tuesday, Park Place Outreach Executive Director Julie Wade and Emmaus uh, House Soup Kitchen Executive Director Ariana Berksteiner. Both of them, we're going to have a frank discussion about poverty and about the services that they offer. <clears throat> also, very, very uh, interesting show next Thursday. Going to have a, a couple of guests talking about the Confederate moral uh, memorial uh, issue. Ron Christopher, attorney, concerned resident, social activist, and Dr. Uh, DiLorenzo, assistant professor of social and behavioral sciences at Savannah State University. So we're going to talk about that issue some, which keep keeps rising its head around these parts and elsewhere in the country, but also more uh, importantly locally. So that's a couple of really good shows next week. Um, well, almost out of time. Well, I am out of time. So thanks for listening to uh, Savannah Lexicon, and uh, you are listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul.